Phil B, to his dying day, maintained that, you know, friendship was the most important thing in his life. And yet he had consistently betrayed his friends, all his friends, really. But Nicholas Elliott, most of all. That was Ben McIntyre talking about the Cold War double agent, Kim Philby, and the effect of his betrayal on those around him. The right from the earliest periods that we look at in the series, friendship is something that can be extended and celebrated through technology. And that was Thomas Dixon on the history of friendship. Hello, and welcome to the History Extra podcast. My name is Rob Attar, and I'm the editor of BBC History magazine, which is the UK's best-selling history magazine. You can find us in all good newsagents, or you can take out a subscription from anywhere in the world. See historyextra.com forward slash subscribe hyphen today for the latest subscription deals. And we have many digital editions available for the iPad, the Kindle, the Kindle Fire, Google Play, and Zinio. For details of these, head to historyextra.com forward slash digital. Kim Philby was a high-ranking British agent who was, however, working for the Soviet Union for many decades. For his new book about this story, historian and author Ben McIntyre explores the impact of Philby's betrayal on his closest friend in the intelligence services and the personal costs of the Cold War. Our reviews editor, Matt Elton, interviewed Ben recently and started by asking him what first inspired him to write this new book. Well, in truth, this book comes directly from John le Carre, um, whose uh, real name is David Cornwall, and he's an old friend of mine, and he's been a wonderful help with my books in the past. And a few years ago, we were, we were just having a walk on Hampstead Heath, and I said to him, uh, and he knew exactly what I was doing, I said to him, you know, what is, what's a good untold story from the Cold War? And um, he knew what I was up to, because I was between books. And he said, um, without hesitation, he said, oh, it's the, uh, it's the friendship between Kim Philby and Nicholas Elliott. And he said, you should write about it. And so I, that really was what set me off. I think, I mean, the relationship between Kim Philby and, and Nicholas Elliott is, is also used by David Cornwall, John le Carre, as, as, as part of the inspiration for, for some of his writing. So it, it's one that is really deeply embedded in, in fiction as well as non-fiction, as it were. So um, starting your research for this book, we know, what new sources did you turn to? Well, uh, there are, there's new evidence about the Kim Philby case emerging all the time. I mean, in fact, just a few weeks ago, um, MI5 released some more declassified files that contain little snippets of evidence on, on Kim Philby. Um, there is a huge literature, a huge secondary literature on Kim Philby, but as I say, there is more archival material arriving. That said, neither MI5 nor MI6 has yet released its entire files on Kim Philby. MI6 never will because they are really I suspect, too embarrassing um, ever to see the light of day. Also, MI6 has a different policy. MI5 will eventually release its own files, but again, that may well take a while. Um, the other main source of information actually comes from, from interviews with former and serving uh, intelligence officers, and perhaps most importantly of all, private papers belonging to the, uh, the Elliot family. I, I really couldn't have written this book without the help of the Elliots, um, who've just been the most fantastic source they simply just handed over all their, their, their father's papers and said, help yourself. Um, so heading back to the start of this story, when did the characters first meet? Well, this is, I mean, the Kim Philby story is well known. I mean, and, and, and elements of it have been told over the years. What this book does, I hope, is to tell it from a completely different perspective, which is really the perspective of friendship. And in particular, one defining friendship, which was between Kim Philby and Nicholas Elliott. And they were two intelligence officers who joined uh, the intelligence service in the, in, the, in the Second World War, at the height of the Second World War, and they became close, close friends and uh, rose in tandem, really, within the Secret Intelligence Service, better known as MI6. And that entire time, Kim Philby was systematically betraying Nicholas Elliott and taking every secret that he told him and passing it straight to Moscow because what Nicholas Elliott didn't know was that by the time he met 
Kim Philby in 1939. Uh, Kim Philby had already been a, a Soviet intelligence for the last six years, uh, codenamed Agent Stanley. Um, because uh, Kim Philby was actually recruited at Cambridge in 1934, or shortly after leaving Cambridge, in fact. And uh, this was a secret that Elliot did not know and never knew until right at the end of the story. So it's a way of telling the Kim Philby story, but through the prism of this very close, very British, rather extraordinary friendship. Mm. And so what impression do we get of the characters of these two men? Well, in, in, outwardly, they were, in a way, peas in a pod. I mean, they were identical in their tastes and interests and, and their upbringing. Both um, had been to public school. Both had been to Cambridge. Both had very hard-driving fathers who they were desperate to impress. So outwardly, I mean, they had an awful lot in common. Theirs was a relationship that was sort of built, if you like, on kind of... the that rather odd kind of basis of sort of wartime and post-war male friendships, which was sort of cricket and, and alcohol and sort of set-piece jokes, those were the kind of things that bound them together. So outwardly, they, they seem to be absolutely, in a way, identical. And, and what's so fascinating in a way for me about this story is that although they had these almost identical upbringings and, and attitudes towards life, they, they, went, they headed in diametrically opposite political directions, in one case secretly. Um, and it's, that's part of the fascination, really, is what causes two men who appear to be so similar to, to end up being so utterly different, two close friends who end up secretly being the bitterest enemies. Mm. And at what point did this you know, change in direction first start? Can we trace it back to a point or a period? Well, I mean, what's in a way makes the story poignant is that when, I mean, the, the story goes that they rose up through the ranks. Both were, were considered to be candidates uh, to become the head of MI6. Uh, Kim Philby was slightly older and he was, as it were, slightly ahead of, of Nicholas Elliott. But they sort of tracked each other over the years. And, and Philby's last big job for MI6 was as uh, station chief in Washington, one of the plum postings where he was liaising between the FBI and the CIA and MI6, and he was pouring secrets to Moscow. Now, at the end of that period, in 1951, Burgess and McLean, the two other Soviet spies, defected to the Soviet Union, and that meant that the finger of suspicion began to point at Kim Philby, and he was in serious trouble. He was called back to London. He was grilled. But his main defender, the person who absolutely stood by him and insisted that he was innocent, was Nicholas Elliott. And then when Kim Philby was finally th uh, forced to leave MI6, it was Nicholas Elliott who stood by him during the wind wind sort of wilderness years, as it were. He paid for his children's education. He lent him money. And he eventually got him a job in the Middle East, in Beirut, working for the Observer and for the Economist, and then, amazingly enough, got him back into MI6. So, so Elliot really is the kind of, he's the key figure who, of all the MI6 officers, and many of them did back Philby, refused to believe he was he was guilty. Elliot really is the linchpin, which meant that when Philby was finally exposed, and this didn't happen to, until 1963, when uh, a, a former friend of his uh, revealed to MI5 that she had been re uh, that Philby had tried to recruit her as a KGB officer, as a, sorry, as a KGB agent very many years earlier and that kind of set the ball rolling again and when Elliot discovered this he was of course absolutely shattered I mean he was completely sort of distraught but he insisted that he and only he should be allowed to travel to Beirut to confront his old friend Kim Philby and establish whether or not he was guilty and to wring a confession out of him so that in a way is the sort of climax of the book I mean, there's several things there. One is, of course, that conversation, which is extraordinary. Um, what unfolded there and how, how did it affect the lives of these two men, I suppose? Well, uh, what Elliot did was he wired up a room in uh, Christian Beirut, uh, an apartment there. Um, uh, he wired it for sound, put bugs under the sofas, and Philby was invited to a, a meeting with his MI6 handler. He did not know that that was going to be that Nicholas Elliott was going to be waiting for him. And it is an extraordinary moment, in a way. I mean, um, Nicholas Elliott answered the door, and the first thing that Kim Philby said to him was, ah, I rather thought it would be you, which, which set off, believe it or not, I, I mean, a mole hunt within 
uh, MI6 that continues, I mean, the reverberations continue today because some interpreted that, that remark as being evidence that Philby had somehow been tipped off from within MI6 that Elliot was on his way. It, actually, it's, there's a much simpler explanation. I mean, Kim Philby had been expecting to be collared. He was expecting someone to get him. And, and really, he knew that if anyone was going to come and, come and confront him, it was going to be Nicholas Elliott. And, and the conversation that ensued is an extraordinary one, really. I mean, if you listen to it, I've, I've, you know, I, I, I know what's in it because, I mean, various people have heard it and, and I've been passed on what, what it contains. It sounds like a sort of polite conversation between two old friends having a cup of tea. Actually, the subtext is a brutal duel really between people on opposite sides of the Cold War and what Elliot was after really was a confession. He needed Philby to admit what had happened and the conversation continued for three days and he did in fact extract a confession from Philby in the end. Philby or rather to be, to be very precise a partial confession. Philby was far too clever to cough everything up but he did give enough away uh, and he did make enough statements uh, for, for Elliot to be pretty sure that he'd got him. Now the quid pro quo was that in return for this confession Philby would be given immunity from prosecution that he would never uh, be forced uh, to stand trial. What happened next has been a subject of controversy ever since, really, because very shortly after this, this long and intense confrontation, Philby climbed on a boat, uh, a Soviet steamer anchored in, in Beirut Harbor and disappeared, fled to Moscow. Now, there are, there are really two ways of interpreting this moment. You either believe, as Philby um, let it be interpreted afterwards with his KGB handlers that somehow he had escaped from MI6, that this was the final crowning achievement of the master spy who had sort of slipped away from MI6. There's another interpretation, which I think is rather more plausible. Um, and, and Nicholas Elliott, it has to be said, uh, consistently muddied the waters about what he had actually done afterwards. I mean, he told different versions to different people. But it seems to me much more likely that, in fact, Elliott literally and metaphorically left the door open to Moscow. It is undoubtedly clear that MI6 did not want to have a full court trial of Kim Philby. It would have been hugely embarrassing to have him on the, on the stand. It, who knows what he would have revealed. They wanted him out of the way. Um, they didn't really mind whether he remained in Beirut and drank himself to death in the Beirut bars, but what they did not want was, was, a, was him holding a press conference and saying, yes, I've been a spy all these years, because it would have just crippled MI6. And so it, it looks very as if Elliot simply walked away. He left the country. He did not leave any surveillance on Philby. He could not have made it easier for Philby to flee. And interestingly, I found a letter that, that Philby had written to Nicholas Elliot shortly after his defection in which he admitted that he believed that Elliot had wanted him to do a fade. Now, a fade is spy jargon for a defection. And We'll never know exactly what happened here, but it is, I think, pretty convincing that Philby himself believed that he had not jumped, that he had in the end been pushed. I mean, talking about the characters of these two men again, do we get a sense of how Philby squared his friendship with Elliot and his betrayal over all these years? It's a very interesting question. I mean, Philby, to his dying day, maintained that, you know, friendship was the most important thing in his life. And yet he had consistently betrayed his friends, all his friends, really. But Nicholas Elliott, most of all. The truth is, uh, Philby was an extraordinary mixture of parts, really. He was, on the one hand, an extraordinarily charming man. I mean, he, people absolutely adored him. As one of his contemporaries uh, said, you didn't just like Philby, you worshipped him. And, but that was combined with this extraordinary ruthlessness. I mean, Philby sent many, many hundreds, if not thousands of people to their deaths and he never expressed a single word of remorse for any of it, let alone changed his political spots. Now, he, he always painted that as being a kind of ideological consistency, that he had been a, a communist from the age of 18, and he had never wavered from that belief. You can interpret it that way. I 
I actually think that is a sort of bigotry. I think he, he flatly refused to address the, the truth about Stalinism or the truth about the organization that he had served all his life because he couldn't afford to. He, he just did not want to face up to the reality. So you have this extraordinary tension in his life between his, his amazing capacity to make friends but his absolute willingness to betray them as well. Does his character help to explain why he was not caught for so long? Oh, undoubtedly. I mean, it is partly his character. Uh, you know, people absolutely adored him and, and refused to believe ill of him. But it's also really a, a story about class to some extent. Um, the, the members of MI6 belong to a very elite group of upper middle class public school, university educated people who, who really rallied round uh, one of their own in a way that had a lot to do with, with kind of class solidarity and a kind of strange clubby mentality um, that really was very, in a way, very particular to the times. I don't think you'd ever find anything quite like that anymore. And, and Philby is an interesting character because in a way, although he was a lifelong communist, he was also an elitist and he believed that he belonged as a, as a, you know, as a secret spy within MI6 working for KGB, he genuinely believed he belonged to what he called an elite force. And, and there is a way of looking at the, at the sort of Philby and Elliot story that it is really in a way a story about clubs. It's about belonging to ever more exclusive clubs. And as a member of the Cambridge Spy Ring, Kim Philby belonged to, you know, arguably the most exclusive club of all. I mean, in terms of understanding this story within its context, what light does it shed um, on the Cold War more generally, examining this story as two characters or as a series of characters, do you think? Well, I think we've always understandably tended to interpret the Cold War as a kind of a, a bleak, black and white ideological conflict, that it's, uh, it's about politics and it's about sort of global realpolitik and, and, and an ideological sort of rift that kind of tore the world apart. This story really, I hope, gives it a much more human dimension. And, and what, it, what it says, I think, is that this isn't necessarily a story about nuclear warheads and, you know, the fear of Third World War and Moscow and Washington and, and London. It's actually a much more brutal and sort of personal and psychological battle that is taking place not necessarily on the, you know, the frontier of, of East and West Berlin, but is actually taking place in the clubs and restaurants of London and Washington, that there is an, there is an intense and, and very extraordinary battle going on between old friends. And I think we often tend to forget that, and that the, the 1930s produced this amazing ideological ferment that really defined the lives of an entire generation. And so I hope it's kind of given a, a slightly more personal and sort of, um, in a way, I suppose in a way, a psychological and emotional um, angle to, to, to a story that it tends to be seen as a political story. What was the biggest thing that surprised you in your research, I suppose? I suppose it was, well, two things, if I may, and they are the same sort of sides of the coin, really. One is the intense loyalty that Nicholas Elliott and people like him felt towards a comrade, and a uh, comrade is the wrong word because that has connotations of, of sort of communism, but, you know, towards someone that they had fought with shoulder to shoulder during the war. And they just could not believe that someone who had the right accent, who'd been to the right school, who had, who had actually had an extraordinarily successful career, as an intelligence officer during the war. I mean, Kim Philby was responsible for some amazing um, bits of intelligence work against the Germans. I mean, at that point, of course, there was no ideological conflict for him because the Soviets were allied um, to, to, to Britain. He felt they were all on the same side. And so uh, I think it's really the, it was the depth of loyalty that someone like Kim Philby inspired and the utter sort of collapse of everything that these people had believed in when they discovered that this person that they had nurtured and defended and, and sort of supported all these years really was all the time batting for the other side. So you have this intense loyalty and then this extraordinary and very damaging discovery that, that really they'd been harboring a sort of serpent the whole time. And that, I mean, that effect on MI6 and MI5 actually had a generational impact. I mean, it, it took an entire generation for the services to recover from that. Mm. I mean, to what extent can we see this conversation between Philby and Elliot as one of the most important conversations of the Cold War? Is that fair to say? 
Oh, undoubtedly. I mean, it is in a way a distillation of the Cold War itself. I mean, it it it, it brings it down into a kind of into a into a hot Beirut apartment, um, you know, on 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 a on a January day in 1963, and it and it really is a kind of focus for the whole conflict itself because the stakes the stakes were enormously high in the spy war. I mean, we often it's you know James Bond has made this this story of intelligence seem as if it is really a game. Well, it definitely wasn't a game for, for people like Philby and Elliot. I mean, huge numbers of lives were, were at stake. Huge numbers of lives had already been lost. And it really was a kind of pivotal moment, really. And you touched on the start about John le Carre. Um, this story is obviously a hugely enduring one. Um, why do you think that is? And did that present any challenges in writing this book? Well, I mean, it is, it is a hugely enduring story. It is, it is hitherto really only ever found expression in fiction. I mean, in, in the, in the form of, um, John le Carre's masterful, uh, spy novels. Yes, I mean, it did present uh, issues. I mean, there are, there are, there are elements to it. I mean, part of the, part of the issues that it presented were, were that spies are tremendously good at making up their own pasts. Um, you know, they are born fabulists, um, which is, it is no accident, I think, that, you know, the greatest spy novelists have also themselves worked in intelligence at some time. You know, David Cornwall, John le Carre being a very good example, but there are many others, Ian Fleming, Somerset Maugham, you know, these are people who, who worked in intelligence, and, and intelligence is partly about making it up. I mean, what you're doing if you're a spy is you're creating a kind of parallel fictional world and trying to lure other people into it. Well, that is, almost a definition of, of, of novel writing. So trying to fill it out, the reality, from what all these spies have said about the past was one of the great challenges because, uh, as I say, all, all the characters in here have a track record. I mean, Kim Philby being perhaps the most egregious example of making up the past to suit themselves. So that was one of the challenges, particularly when you're trying to write a sort of n- a narrative non-fiction story that, that has to move, as it were, seamlessly along. If you could ask a question of one of the characters in this book, who would you ask and what would you ask them, I suppose? What a very good question. I think I would ask both of them the same question, Nicholas Elliott and Kim Philby. And it's a question that I would like to ask of them near the end of their lives, really, which is, is Kim Philby still your friend, Nicholas Elliott? And is Nicholas Elliott still your friend, Kim Philby? Because the extraordinary thing is that although this defining friendship, well, it destroyed Nicholas Elliott, really, it ruined his career. He never stopped wondering how it was that someone he had believed so utterly could turn out to be someone he really didn't know at all. And yet you find that both had this extraordinary lingering affection for each other in spite of everything that had happened, in spite of this... In extraordinary ideological chasm between them, they still were, in some extraordinary way, friends. And I would love to have asked them how that felt. That's such a strong friendship to be intact after all of that happened over such a long time. It's amazing. It's either a friendship or it's a sort of addiction. It's a sort of unwillingness to pull away. I mean, that's what fascinates me is that, you know, most of us would say, well, if we've suffered that kind of betrayal, that's, that's got to be it. Or if I've betrayed someone that badly, they have every right to end the friendship. These were men who sort of, in a way, were terribly traditional and couldn't finally quite bring themselves to do that. Incredible. And finally, um, what new impression of this story in this period do you hope that readers leave this book with? Well, I hope, I hope, particularly for a younger generation of, of readers who, who may not know that the Philby story uh, very well, I hope it gives it a human dimension, that it takes it away from bristling warheads on either side of a, of a frontier, and indeed from sort of rather prejudiced views from, you know, the capitalist West and the, and the, and the, the communist East, that this is all about ideology and clashing, um, you know, sort of superpowers, that really there is a kind of an intensely personal private, if you like, and secret Cold War going on, of which this, I hope, is, is rather an extraordinary example. That was Ben McIntyre. Spy Among Friends, Kim Philby and the Great Betrayal is out now, published by Bloomsbury. And Ben is also presenting a two-part BBC documentary about Philby at the start of April. For further details, 
see the TV listings online at historyextra.com. Now, if you like your history, don't forget to check out BBC History magazine. Our March issue is on sale now and includes articles on Henry VIII's Six Wives, Viking Seafarers, the Chinese Long March and the Second World War Home Front, among other things. You can pick up a copy in all good news agents or download it in one of our many digital formats. And now we have a short advertisement break. Jay Winter, editor of the three-volume Cambridge History of the First World War, introduces the first comprehensive global history of the conflict. The Cambridge History of the First World War is the first attempt to provide a fully global coverage of the conflict. First of all, a chronological account of the outbreak of the war, its origins, and then the military history that unfolded. In volume two, we deal with the state uh, and understand political life as being in the crucible of the violence of total war. And the third volume of the Cambridge history uh, is a history of civil society, understood as the families, uh, the labor forces, uh, the populations that were under the stress of total war. The Cambridge History of the First World War is now available online and in all major bookshops, priced at £90 per volume. Before our next interview, it's time for the latest history news with our website editor, Emma McFarnan. A new book suggests that the Nazis were responsible for the burning of the Reichstag in 1933. According to historian and former trial lawyer Benjamin Carter Hett, the Nazis set fire to the German parliament building in order to seize dictatorial power. The fire was exploited to secure approval for an emergency decree that suspended freedom of speech, freedom of the press and the right to assembly, and permitted the regime to arrest and incarcerate political opponents without specific charge. The fire has been blamed on 24-year-old Dutch communist stonemason Marinus van der Lubbe, who was arrested at the scene. If his argument is correct, Hett sheds new light on the Nazis as having calculated a much clearer route to power than has so far been realised. You can read more about this story at historyextra.com. In other news, the legs of an 800-year-old medieval monk have been discovered poking out of a cliff face in Wales. According to the Daily Telegraph, the thigh bones were found after recent storms caused severe coastal erosion. They are badly damaged and missing their knees, shins and feet. The area of Monk Nash in South Wales was a burial ground for Cistercian monks in the Middle Ages. Coastal archaeologist Carl James Langford says the bones likely belong to a monk from the 1200s. Meanwhile, a letter from Alice in Wonderland author Lewis Carroll is to be sold at auction this week. Written under his own name, Charles Dodgson, he complains about the downside of fame. He says he hates being pointed out to and stared at by strangers and treated as a lion. The handwritten letter is expected to fetch between three and four thousand pounds. Thanks for that, Emma. And don't forget to visit historyextra.com for all the latest history news. The nature of friendship in Britain has changed greatly throughout history, culminating in today's focus on social media relationships, which can see some users boasting more than a thousand Facebook friends. Dr Thomas Dixon is about to present a Radio 4 series that will explore the changing meaning of friendship over the past 500 years. He spoke to our features editor, Charlotte Hodgman. So, so the notion of friendship has, has changed quite a lot throughout history. Um, when do we first see the word friendship being used and what sort of relationship was that describing? The word friend has a very, very long history. Um, it's an old English word and one of the interesting things that comes out in the series is that its meaning... It meant love and it meant free, the word friend, but it also meant a family member. And that's really important at the very beginning of the series, that the distinction between friends and family is very blurred um, and only comes into focus during the modern history of the term. And what, what did the early modern social network um, look like and how does the notion of friendship fit into that? We were really keen for the whole series to get into the nitty-gritty of everyday life, to get at friendships that were real people in real, lively, emotional relationships, not just the elite ideas about them, which are relatively easy uh, to get hold of. So the early modern social network that we look at at the very start of the series, 500 years ago, is the world of gossips and good fellows, of women gathering in their gardens or around the well or in the bakehouse and talking to each other perhaps about children, childbirth, what happened in their neighbourhood. 
uh, and the men also gossiping, chatting, talking to each other perhaps about business in the tavern, in the pub, over a few drinks. So in many ways, the early modern social network is a lot like a social network we might recognize today. Um, but we also wanted to get at some of those more subtle differences, especially the geographical ones and the emphasis on kinship as a almost synonym for friendship in the early modern period. And why would men seem to be um, better at friendship than women? The idea that men are better than women at friendship is a very ancient one and part of a general patriarchal intellectual history according to which men are best at pretty much everything. In the case of friendship in particular, it was supposed to be an intellectual and a moral relationship if you read classical philosophers. And men were thought to be more intellectual and more moral, to have much stronger minds and stronger virtue. Virtue itself means manly. So, men were thought to excel in those qualities. But there's a difference between that kind of elite conception of friendship and the more everyday reality of friendship in which it was known and understood that men and women, of course, had friends. And then finally, that the gendering of friendship changes during the 19th and 20th century so that it becomes much more normal as it is today to think that women are better at friendship, that somehow women are more emotional, more in touch with their feelings and better at being companions and confiding in each other in a friendly way. And that's pretty much the view that is most common today. And you also mentioned um, letters and poetry that were written by women in the 18th century. Um, what can these tell us about the changing ideas about sort of friendship and marriage and that sort of thing during the period? The 18th century is a real sort of high point of the history of emotions and feelings in general. There's something called the cult of sensibility or the culture of sensibility that especially educated people, but more broadly as well, was starting to celebrate human feeling as something that tied people together, people of all classes, um, through these shared feelings, including love and friendship. And so in the 18th century, people were using that cultural milieu to rethink friendship and it could become quite overblown and quite romantic in the way that it was expressed in letters between women, between men, uh, really astonishingly intimate and passionate letters between both men and women to friends of their own sex. And then tentatively as well, the idea was broached that a man and a woman could be friends. This is what's sometimes today called the when Harry met Sally question. Can a man and a woman just be friends? Uh, and in the series, we look at pioneer feminists, including Mary Wollstonecraft, to see what they said about the idea that a woman could be just as rational as a man and could be just as good friends as a man and even be friends with a man. Uh, but even in the case of someone like Mary Wollstonecraft, that could have quite troubling consequences. And, and what sort of um, external factors have affected friendships during, um, through history? So things like education and that, sort of, that type of thing. The history of friendship is part of a really complex social history, and as I've said, that's something we wanted to really get into in this series. And I'll just mention two strands of that that I think are really interesting. One is the history of technology. The right from the earliest periods that we look at in the series, friendship is something that can be extended and celebrated through technology. Whether that technology is something as simple as a quill pen and a piece of paper, or whether it's a printing press, or later the telegraph, the telegram, the telephone, the smartphone, the internet. So technology is a huge part of the history of friendship, the way that you can travel both physically and virtually across time and space in a way that means that your social network can be almost infinitely extended through technology. The other thing that's incredibly important is education. Prior to the 19th century, children, by and large, would have had close friendships, first of all, with their siblings and perhaps their very close neighbours. But it was through mass education, starting in the 19th century, that it became more normal for children's real close and important friendships that would shape perhaps their whole lives would be made at school and increasingly at state-funded schools. And that was a big social change from the 19th century onwards. And from that period onwards, in both the great public schools and the state-funded schools, there were stories and memoirs and reminiscences of the huge power of the emotional friendships formed at school. Uh, and then that continues finally into more recent decades when it became more normal for a large proportion of the population to go to university. And I suppose that is a moment that I'd associate with the 1990s, the generation of people like me, I suppose, leaving university and watching the sitcom Friends, which 
continues to reach a huge global audience, that kind of extended university educated adolescent period in your 20s now, when you're not married, you're not living with your parents, uh, and friends are incredibly important. That's a big change in demographics that's shaped friendship in more recent years. And a lot's been written about the, the powers battalions of the First World War and, and the bonds formed between soldiers in, in times of conflict. Um, what do you make of that type of, that type of friendship? For me, learning more about the PALS regiments in the First World War was obviously one of the most poignant and touching moments in making the series. We focus in that episode particularly on the Grimsby chums, and I learned a bit about some of their stories. Um, it's extraordinarily upsetting, really, to read about these men from all classes. The PALS battalions, a lot of them were kind of middle-class regiments of clerks, um, bank tellers, uh, solicitors, and so forth, and some of them more working-class uh, demographics and these men are encouraged and persuaded and enthused with the idea of signing up to fight shoulder to shoulder with their friends their mates their pals their companions and in doing so they have these extraordinarily traumatic as well as emotionally tender experiences on the western front and of course as we know many of them died there they died in their friends arms died and were buried next to their friends and i think the source that that we talk about in the series that I found most interesting on this was a, an autobiographical novel by someone called Frederick Manning, which questions whether any of this is true friendship at all. It says there is the kind of military enforced camaraderie. There's an almost instinctive willingness to risk one's life, to get injured or even killed for the sake of another soldier. But he questions whether this really is friendship in the normal everyday sense and so that's a really interesting question in both the first and second world wars as to whether the intense emotions experienced by men together were really friendship or something else and, and just finally and um, what, what do you think friendship will look like in say a hundred years time based on you know where we are now i think the future of friendship is a really fascinating question uh some people that we spoke to for the series uh, understandably were very concerned that modern technology was destroying the true art of friendship, that people might have hundreds or thousands of Facebook friends or Twitter followers, but they'd lost the true art of friendship. And throughout the 20th century, people have expressed this fear with reference to the motor car and to the telephone and then to the internet, that technology will destroy friendship rather than enable it. Um, and I have some sympathy for that. I know from my own experience that you can feel very connected sitting at home in your kitchen, clicking on pictures of other people's children and feeling that you have some contact with their lives. But on the other hand, it really is not the same thing as sitting in the same room, perhaps in the same pub with a friend, being able to hug them, touch them, see their facial expression um, and share a drink and a meal with them. So... In answer to the question of what would I predict uh, based on the history of friendship, I would say that people will continue to value most of all the kind of friends that they can touch and see and hear and speak to and, and hug in person uh, and use technology to facilitate uh, a kind of penumbra of friendship, that, uh, a kind of sh uh, an extended penumbra of, of an outer circle of friends, but will always want to be physically with their real friends. And I don't expect that to change, and I don't expect people to become friends with robots. That was Thomas Dixon. Thomas is director of the Centre for the History of Emotions at Queen Mary University of London. His new series, 500 Years of Friendship, will begin next Monday, the 24th of March, at 1.45pm on BBC Radio 4. Well, that's almost all for this week. Do get in touch with your views on podcast at historyextra.com and we might read out some of your messages in future episodes. And you can also keep in touch with us on social media. We're on Twitter at History Extra, or you can become a Facebook fan, facebook.com forward slash History Extra. And do make sure to visit our website, historyextra.com, for all the latest history news, blogs, quizzes, image galleries, and a whole lot more. Next week, we'll be joined by Daniel Hanan to talk about Britain's role in promoting freedom around the globe while Charlotte Hodgman will be investigating one of the Anglo-Saxon world's greatest treasures. Be sure to join us for that. This History Extra podcast was recorded in Bristol and produced by Jack Fletcher. 